do you get into radio? There's medical school, dental school, accounting school, you know, whatever. And he told me, he was all slurred, but he told me these four things. <laughs> so I ran to my car, popped open the glove box, took out the insurance card and, you know, wrote it down. And I'm not making this up. Six weeks later, I was on the radio in Philadelphia doing mornings. La Pizarra, The Slate, exploring creative minds in the entertainment industry. Here's your host, Nikki Mondellini. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of La Pizarra. We're here continuing with season nine. Can you believe it? And today, aside from thanking you, I, I also want to say that I'm super happy that you're joining me because I'm very excited to share this interview with you. My guest has been inducted in the Texas Radio Hall of Fame. He has interviewed countless celebrities and politicians and everyone in between. And today he's also the CEO of his own media company. His name is Sam Malone. Sam earned his BBA in finance from Temple University in his hometown of Philadelphia, but he started working in morning radio soon after graduation. He worked at legendary stations like Eagle 106 in Philadelphia and KISS 98.5 in Buffalo, New York. Later, he arrived in Houston to take over the morning show at 104 KRBE. The Sam Malone Show hit number one and became a staple of morning drives for more than 12 years. Clear Channel Radio made him an offer in 2005, and the Sam Malone Show then took Mix 96.5 all the way up to number one in the ratings. But Clear Channel also offered Sam something that he couldn't get elsewhere, his own talk show on 740 KTRH. So from 6 to 9 a.m., he hosted a top 40 morning show, and then from 10 to noon, talk radio, all in the same building, and I really don't know how he got the energy to do all of that. But then Sam quickly realized the importance of video in today's media landscape. So he developed a video streaming platform, becoming the first radio host to televise his own show on smartphones and laptops on demand 24-7. He's the permanent fill-in for nationally syndicated host Mike Gallagher, and he can be heard on over 300 radio stations with over 7 million listeners. In 2014, Sam opened Houston's leading media marketing company, 512 New Media, which develops, creates, and delivers new media services, including website construction, email marketing, social media content and strategy, and video production. And then he also produces commercial content for clients nationwide in a variety of industries. And now let's explore the creative mind of Sam Malone. Hey, Sam, welcome to La Pizarra. How are you? Outstanding. Thank you for the invite, Nick. It's wonderful to be here. Well, um, I was super excited to to do this interview because um, you have all the experience in the world with broadcasts, radio, <laughs> with interviewing people. And now, as a matter of fact, I wanted to say congratulations because you are celebrating this year 30 years of radio, right? Of Houston radio. 30 years. Believe it or not, 1993. I got here February of 1993 is when uh, I was shipped down here to take over KRBE in the morning show. It's hard to believe it was 30 years ago. That is just unheard of. It just, it it's just a, flies by, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. It's a good thing I was five when I took the job because I'm only 35 <laughs> right now. Of so. course you are. Of course, nobody's going to question <laughs> only that. Only 35. Nobody will question that, Sam. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's let's go a little bit into, into your background, into your history. Um, I'm, I'm super curious to know how someone who goes from a BBA in finance suddenly decides to start in radio. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, this is a case, a true story. I'm not making this up. So yeah, I, I was uh, getting my degree. I was a senior uh, in college. I was doing casino analysis and I'm a, I was an arbitrage specialist. That's, that's, that's just, I love numbers. And there was a pretty girl, a very pretty girl I was trying, I, I asked to date. Um, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't date me. She literally said, I can't, I'm not going to date you. You're poor. So it's honest to God, what she said. Oh, oh come on. But <laughs> that's total truth. So, uh, but she was so damn pretty and smelled so good and looked so good that I would like drive her around. Like if she was going out, I'd be like, you need a ride just so the guys in the hood can see me with a really <laughs> pretty girl. Okay. Okay. So she says like, you know, uh, one night she's looking, I'm going to go uh, meet my boyfriend. I'm like, who's your boyfriend? 
And she said his name, and I'm like, that's the guy on the radio. He's a very famous disc jockey in Philadelphia. And she says, yeah, do you want to meet him? I'm like, of course. So I drive, any, of course, any chance to drive her around. Yeah. So it was about 1 o'clock in the morning in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is outside of Philly, my hometown. And the DJ was doing an appearance. And I, I'm like, oh, my God, listen to this guy. It was so cool. And he was very chemically enhanced in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm bringing a pretty girl to meet him. There's already six girls lined up to meet him as he's leaning on his Mercedes. And I'm like, what is wrong with this picture? I have to work. <laughs> and I literally walked up to him and I said, um, I have to ask you a question. I'm like, how do how do you get in the radio? How does one? Because I, here I'm doing casino analysis. You can't open up a casino. All right, there's rules and regs. It's called barriers to entry. You can't open up a bank if you want. You can't open up an airport. How do you get in the radio? There's medical school, dental school, accounting school, you know, whatever. And he told me, he was all slurred, but he told me these four things. <laughs> so I ran to my car, popped open the glove box, took out the insurance card and, you know, wrote it down. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. Six weeks later, I was on the radio in Philadelphia doing mornings. Wow. Now, I still had a semester or inside of a semester to go. So I had to figure out how I was going to make my classes. So I was kind of running back and forth. But I graduated, got my degree, kept working in Philadelphia. I was 22 years old. I was a knucklehead. <laughs> so that's how I got in the radio. It had nothing to do with, I don't have a marketing background, a communications background, a radio background, a media background. All I do is I have a gift for gab. But I just asked the right question at the right time. Yeah. And he answered the right question at the right time. So Okay, okay. I think that's that's incredible because the first thing that got you into radio, I mean, it's just like a little door that opened something that was just there for you in your destiny, I would say, you know. Because nobody tries it out to you know, just, just to get that kind of a life, if it's not something that is really within you, if, if you're not really destined to do that, if you don't have that, that gift of, 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 uh, talk, you know, of, of knowing how to ask the right questions and everything, it just, I think it just, it's amazing how it all developed for you. And you, you've been in, in this business for such a long time, uh, that it's, it's, it's crazy how, how you started it without even that being your intent from the get go, right? Right. Yeah. You are, you're, you're spot on. I just, Ask that question because I'm very inquisitive, and by I had no idea about radio. I, I don't know nothing about radio. In fact, when I got the job, and I got into the radio station in Philadelphia, I didn't know how to operate the board. You know, the big control board that the DJ sits behind. So I had to come up with a plan to take. There was an engineer. Engineers fix things at the radio stations. There was an engineer that like nobody talked to. He was kind of lone. He was a loner, kind of weird looking dude. But I said to him, look, I will take you out to the finest restaurant in Philadelphia. Or I'll give you the cash. Can you sneak me in at night and show me how to turn on the microphone? How do you make a commercial? How do you play the music? And he was like, what? I'm like, dude, I'll give you 200 bucks, whatever you want. But that's like $450 today. Yeah. And I came in at like 1 or 2 in the morning one day. And he was there in another studio. And he said, this is how you... Hit this button. This is for the mic. Hit this button. This is for the music. If you want to make a commercial, you hit record. It goes to the reel, to, you know, whatever. Wow. So. Oh, my gosh. That, that's amazing. Would you say that's one of the biggest obstacles that you've had in your career, just to learn that technical aspect? Oh, there's been a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the, that was, I was not, listen, I'll be real quick. I tell everybody, you know, I sound like a nice guy on the radio. I was not a nice guy growing up in an inner city Philadelphia. So I got thrown out of public schools for fighting in the eighth grade. And I had to stay home for a while. Then I had to I'd go to school outside of the city. That was an obstacle. Yeah. You know, yeah. I didn't have the grades. I, I got into Penn State first, but I failed out because I just was not academically suited at that moment. That was an obstacle, getting thrown out of a school like Penn State on grades. So there's been a lot of obstacles. Then I had to work to pay for college. My parents were blessed, gave me 25% of the tuition. That's what they had saved. Yeah. The other 75% was up to me. So now I had to work to fail out of college, which is not a good idea. Mm. So anyway, it, there's been a lot of obstacles. I, the technological or learning, you know how you get a new iPhone? Mm -hmm. and, and you'll ask one of your kids if you have children or something, that, oh, yeah. how does this work? That was that equivalent back then in 1986. Got it. You know? Got it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's incredible because, I mean... 
now you do so much. I mean, you, you've been learning, I, I guess, on the job and because you're, you're just naturally inquisitive, like you said, and, and you know how to ask the right questions. And it's just also the gift of your personality. Not everyone can just be like that in front of a mic. Many people just freeze, right? And, and you're just, you know, you, you're going on and you're talking and you're making this happen. And then, you know, you developed the first uh, streaming radio, like video streaming, and your show was the first one to be on video, and which I think that's amazing. You know, now, now of course, a lot of people, and we have like this podcast, you know, on, on YouTube, uh, and, and many people do that. But um, definitely, I would say you have evolved and transitioned so many times in your career right so um what is now like one of the things that that uh you wished you had done i mean you, you've been learning and doing so many things but something that that would have made it easier for you <sighs> that's a good question um i i'd say that's a wonderful wonderful question i don't know uh, i always and people who know me know i, I don't sit still i got I used to call it ants in the pants. Mm -hmm. So like like being the first to broadcast a live morning show in 2013, fully produced, you know, um, I don't know what would have made it easier. And maybe I don't, I shouldn't know, you know, and it was God's plan, mm -hmm. you know, grazia dia, it was God's plan to get to where I am because radio and getting to that job in Philly is what led me to meet now my, my now wife. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I, I wonder that's the path that's meant to be. So I guess if there are other paths and I could have done them better, who knows? But, you know, I'm blessed that being on the radio in Philly uh -huh. and asking the MC, uh, uh, there was an event for Bon Jovi. She brought Bon Jovi to town yeah. for a, a, a fundraiser. So I guess there'd be other paths. That's a wonderful question, Nikki, but maybe I shouldn't know what they were, you know, or yeah. what could I have done to speed it up or slow it down? But in, in like in, a, in another instance, I mean, if someone comes and asks you, hey, I want to get into radio. Uh, what is the best tip that you can give me? <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> this is uh, hand signals for dangerous. You know, yeah. um, uh, I was at a wedding and uh, at the Houstonian Hotel, my wife and I, and the woman next to me on my port side, her daughter was, I think it was called UCL, UCLA Film School or something like that. And she went, she, my daughter wants to be a news anchor and I want you to talk to her. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I worked on Channel 2 and Channel 11 and all that. And she's like, well, we want insight and advice. I say, here's the best advice. Get out. <laughs> don't go into radio. And certainly don't go into local news. Do, just, they're dead. Just get away. Take your town somewhere else. Mm. Um, radio is not what it used to be. There's hardly anybody left in the business. Mm. Uh, it's not, it is what it is. When I, when Maria Todd and I were at KRBE, KRB was a standalone radio station. It was by itself in this town. Now, there's a lot of, are in clusters of multiple stations. Uh -huh. We had 44 full-time employees. Our promotions department, I think, got up to 16 people. Today, there's not 16 people in the radio station. Wow. So my advice is, if you have an urge, do you think you're funny and you want to be heard and you want to broadcast, go to Best Buy, get your podcast equipment <laughs> for, for 500 bucks. <laughs> Plug in your room and, and go because uh, local radio is, is you know, is, is no longer a factor. Hmm. Local TV news, as you all know, is no longer a factor. This is what you're doing is the, is the factor, is the future. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. podcasts uh, don't require overhead. They don't require much of an investment. It's just persistence and hard work, determination, clarity, and delivering on your message and platform. Yeah. So this is, if anybody says, hey, my kid wants to be going to radio like you, I'd be like, see what Nikki's doing? Do that. <laughs> and, you know. and here I am in my four by six booth in my house. <laughs> I wouldn't know. You know, the good thing is, like, uh, that looks as professional as anything, you know? Yeah, and it, it looks it's it looks as though it's like wow state of the art but it is it, it's cool you know I'm, I I can be here recording with you even if there's a lawnmower outside and that's like you know I'm blessed to have that because that's amazing Good. yeah uh, but anyway let's let's now dive into like the mechanics or like a, the wonderful world of interviews because you have interviewed amazing people like high profile people Sir Paul McCartney right and uh, I don't know Kevin Costner and Senator John McCain. 
How do you prepare for such amazing interviews? Okay, well, um, add to that list, by the way, Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow, yeah. Michael Bolton, uh, Cher. Wow. Uh, you name it. So yes. here's the secret. I'm going to share with you. Okay. I'm going to take and it out I got this. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this from Larry Kane. Uh, I'm, uh, Larry King, I'm sorry, Larry King. If you remember Larry King, yes. my earpiece is moving out. Yeah. If you remember Larry King from CNN. Oh, yes, okay. yes, of course. Yeah. When I was in college in Philadelphia, his show would run from like midnight to 3 a.m. or something, then 3 a.m. to 6. It was the overnight show. Yeah. And Larry King would interview all these people for like a long period of time. Uh-huh. So I flew out to L.A. on business, and I bumped into Larry, Larry King. And I'm like, Dude, I, it was the first time I bumped into him again, but the very first time I bumped into him, he was eating a blueberry muffin. And I'm like, dude, I just got to ask you a question real fast. He's like, yes, what is it? <laughs> I said, you interview people with books like this thick, right? You interview people with 10 movies. You interview people with all kinds of credentials. Do you read the books? Do you watch the movies? How do you prepare? And this is, and this, I asked Larry King, the king, of all interviews. Uh-huh. I said, do you read the book? He says, of course not. I don't have the time. <laughs> I'm like, well, do you watch the movies? Like if they're plugging a movie and they won an Academy Award or they had famous movies? He goes, no. <laughs> and he's still eating his blueberry muffin because I'll never forget it. And I'm like, well, then how do you do the interview? He says, all I do is ask them questions that I think regular people would ask them if they bumped into them somewhere. Hmm. So I, I went home and pondered it, and I'm like, oh, that kind of makes a lot of sense. You could be, you know, you could say to the guy, oh, I love, like, I interviewed David Bowie. And I, so anyway, I end up interviewing David Bowie on a TV special. I'm not a, a Bowie fan. I don't really know his music other than, like, the number one or number two hits. Not knowing, but I applied that to David Bowie uh-huh. and started making a conversation. But we didn't say, hey, man. On the seventh song of your third album, you used the word cricket, man. What's that mean, <laughs> dude? So you could sit there and go deep and spend hours prepping. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, when you think about all the guests who've been on the show, uh, The Rock, I'm looking at the, on my wall outside The Rock uh, from, I guess, Chuck Norris to Beyonce had been on the show a lot in Destiny's Child. Uh-huh. You just ask them questions like like you're doing. Like, you don't have to dive too deep. Obviously, get that person's name right and kind of where they are. Yeah. If you said, hey, Stan, welcome to the show, <laughs> I'd be like, see ya. <laughs> so anyway, Larry King said, I don't read the books. I don't watch the movies. I don't. All I do is think of questions that regular people would ask huh. if they bumped into them at a place, like an airport. Yeah. Like I bumped into Larry when we were eating. And then I saw him again in San Diego with his family, but it was like, that dude is on the money. If Larry King, who's interviewing five, six, eight people a week on when he was on CNN, he doesn't have time to read the, the, the books. Of course not. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so anyway, that's my tip. Now, wow. Whether it works or not is another story. Yeah, <laughs> but that's amazing. Okay, you do, but don't you get like the fanboy effect or is so jittery nervous to be interviewing those people, you know, to just calm yourself down and then have those questions come into your mind. You know, how do you go past that part? That's a great question. I, I, the last time I got nervous two, maybe it was two, I don't know, two, three years ago, uh, president Donald Trump called me on the radio three times in five months, wow. three times. In five months, and he wanted to talk. He he liked the way that I, he he liked my wordsmithing, whatever he said. That I'm a wordsmith. The very first time he called, I I actually got nervous because well, who wouldn't I've talk? never talked to a I've met living presidents. I had the chance to spend time privately with President Bush when he was president in '43. Um, met Clinton, Carter, but I never had them on the radio. Trump calls, and I swear. I did get a little, it's like, ner- like, oh, my God, I got nervous. Like, you know, I, you could feel it. Yeah. So how do you do it? Just do it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what you know, are you nervous about skydiving? Well, then skydive. Uh-huh. You know, are you nervous about singing in public? 
sing in public, get it over with. Yeah, you just go for it. And just, you know what, just dive in, yeah. get a good night's sleep, <laughs> get a workout in before you go to work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but after that, after like that, I mean, everybody would come up and play. Like Aerosmith came up three times to join me. Bon Jovi came up three times to join me. Wow. I didn't like listen to their music. I didn't look into that. I was like, hey, John. <laughs> hey, Rich here. Hey, Steven Tyler, what's up, man? Nothing, what's up with you? Where have you been recently? You been on vacation? I love that jacket. And then you just start building this rapport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, yeah, it's pretty easy. Wow. Well, it's And you, too, easy to can use. make a million dollars. Well, okay. Well, I, I still think I'm like an interview in, in, in diapers uh, or interviewer in diapers. But here we go, you know, just, just moving along. So I, I, I did want to, you know, this was a bit of an agenda to interview you about this, you know. Uh, That's a, no, no, no. A, you know what? Ask away. If I can help you or if I can help anyone get better, like I was offered the opportunity, then go for it. Ask, you know, any questions that can help you, because uh, who else— you know, we'll promote this and other radio or TV people may be watching. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the things that I, I like to do in this podcast is for people in the industry that want to learn how to do a lot of things, you know, whether it's in front or behind the mic or the camera. Uh, and so that's why this is golden, golden advice. You know, definitely. I you know I love it. Um, what what do you think, like in the whole context, makes a great interviewer, like, you know, talking about making the good interview or just, just going for the questions. But when you listen also to other interviews or when you interview someone and you feel, okay, this is a good one. I'm happy about this interview. You know, what, what are the elements that, that you think are most important? So the most important thing what, to be a good interviewer uh -huh. um, is something I was speaking about today. So, you know, we have a big marketing firm here and we deal with a lot of clients who come up and um, candidates and CEOs and everything. And when somebody vomits on me verbally, and that means they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Mm. And I said this to a, a woman here today who came up. I'm like, ma'am, and this is about being a good interviewer. Yeah. I said, ma'am, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we may listen twice as much as we talk. So a great interviewer, STFU, okay, mm -hmm. knows how to STFU, and listen. And in the very beginning of my career, my first big guest was Carl Weathers, who was um, Apollo Creed and Rocky. Mm. Remember Carl yes, Weathers? Yes, yes, of course. And he came up to the studio, and I met him. He was a very, very nice guy. Shorter. I thought he'd be taller. But he was shorter. But anyway, I was so nervous that I kept talking over him. Mm. That everything he, everything he said, I like talked over. And I was just nervous. And I just wanted him to know I was there, right? And uh, there was a guy working at the radio station. He said, hey, you know what, Sam? I'm like, what? You're on for four hours a day. And Carl Weathers is going to visit one time in your life for 15 minutes. This is me. I'm like, let him talk. yeah, so what's your point? <laughs> he says, STFU, let him talk. The best interview is he can, it doesn't feel like you're going to step on him. You know what, you know, when you step on someone? Yep. And I was then it like, so now all my interviews, I'll be, say to you or President Trump or Sting came up twice to hang out. I'm not a big fan of Sting, but it was cool to, and he played his keyboard. I'm like, Sting! What do you want to play? What's your favorite song? Go. And then he just hung out and played another song and wow. asked me. Def Leppard played for us, came up, complete set up, and played at 8.30 in the morning. Wow. And I, I didn't even know that. I knew, I knew their songs. I just didn't know everybody's name. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, wait. Joe Elliott? Jim Elliott? What's the guy? I'm like, Def Leppard, you guys are great. What do you want to play? <laughs> and then they just started talking, and I started talking. So do you want to be a great interviewer? Shh, be quiet. Let the guest be the rock star superstar. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you're talking 50-50, it's a bad interview. Let them feel it. They can express themselves, tell a story without being interrupted. Uh -huh. And, if, and if, if Sting was, let's just say Sting is up here and he goes, oh, Sam, I just came back from Hawaii. And I go, oh, Hawaii, I was just in Hawaii. Love Hawaii. Oh, we were at the best hotel. <laughs> Sting, well, why have Sting here? Yeah. So if Sting says I was in Hawaii, you go, what was your favorite part? 
Did you did you do any fishing, sailing? I bet you were scuba diving. Tell me, what did you see when you're on? Were you nervous underwater seeing sharks? Let them tell the stories. Yeah. And like and like Bon Jovi or and Stephen Todd of Aerosmith, they had such a good time. Todd's like, I'm coming back, and he did. He was here three. I mean, three times he was hanging out with. That's us. That's so cool. So anyway, that's why I pass along to you and yeah. everybody else. And I learned the hard way. I don't think Carl Weathers, well, I think he's <laughs> passed away, but I don't think he would ever, if he was alive, would ever, never come on again. <laughs> We've reached the end of part one. Please join us next week for part two and the conclusion of this interview. In the meantime, if you can think of anyone who might benefit from this information, please go ahead and share it with them. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe on your podcast player or YouTube if you haven't done so. Share what you liked about this episode on social media and tag us at Nikki Mondellini. 